Later, later. Mm -hmm. So, hi everyone. So, my name is Alona. I'm a data engineer and uh, at Refinitiv. No, and yeah. Yeah. Yay. Okay. Is better? Yes. Okay, again. So my name is Alena. I'm a data engineer at uh, Refinitiv. Uh, so today I will present like two topics about uh, Spark. So as you know, about th three weeks ago, it was a Spark summit in Europe that unfortunately I cannot visit. But uh, the guys uh, share almost, I guess, all the videos. So <laughs> if you go to the website, so there are a lot of uh, very interesting things. Um, so one thing that uh, they share is uh, about uh, uh, Spark uh, 3.0 uh, and like a few features about this. So I just threw about uh, some videos. So I uh, found uh, this uh, uh, these features that could be interesting. Some of them we will cover today. Today, so of course the main things it's a uh, catalyst optimizer. Uh, so as they say, like they improve a lot. But I think maybe you need to find a special video for this. Uh, also very interesting, at least for me, it's pluggable data catalog. So also have no details. Uh, one cool thing, it's Spark Graph. Uh, it's a new model that uh, uh, will work with the graphs and allows you to use a Cypher. It's a language from Neo4j database. So I think it uh, should be really cool things. Uh, one more thing is a dynamic partition planning, so they will cover today. Uh, of starting from this new version, so we can use a binary format uh, for data frames. And there are two features that uh, will be uh, useful when you read uh, files. So we also cover this. Now I don't know how to switch file. Right, left. завис угу ой я не знаю что зависло we have a slight powerpoint uh, latency which is unrelated to any data processing <laughs> related to the quality of powerpoint i guess but uh, It is completely, completely hung. Okay, we'll try to let's see whether it's refreshing. Yeah. Just hold it. There is presentation. Ты мне послала? I'll pop it up. не укороченная. Ой, ой, ой. Ты не в курсе, по да? да, она еще была запакованная. Не переживай. Ты не выкат, да? Um, I'm trying to pull Alena's presentation as a backup from 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 my laptop. Something went really bananas on uh, on 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 the set front. Just give us another second. You can do whiteboarding, right? That would be a lot of whiteboarding. <laughs> yes. But the idea, yeah. So like we actually can talk about it. So what you've seen, the um, the the major bit, the the coolest bit that was added. Um, is, uh, well, apart from Catalyst Optimizer, is the dynamic partition pruning. Let's use this one. So Alona will talk about the DPP, which is uh, a long-awaited uh, lo long feature that will optimize the, um, 
unprepared joins um, across large data sets and uh, bells and whistles um, around the file sources there in the end so we can actually skip through so that no one is uh, delayed here. Yeah, I launch it off. See, my PowerPoint is better than yours. Let's check. Maybe, okay. Okay, yes, it works. Okay, so ab about dynamic partition pruning. So we start with uh, this first slide, it's like teaser slide uh, that show uh, performance uh, on some query on some uh, data set around 10 terabytes. So what you'll see, like if you don't use uh, this dynamic uh, pruning, so the qu query will run around 20, 25 minutes. But if you use this feature, so it will run around 10 seconds. Really? Yes, so now it, when everyone is impressed, so we can see how, how it works. <laughs> is um, it actually running? <laughs> yes, yes, it's a real test. It's made by Databricks. <laughs> Uh, so first, let's uh, remember how works just static partition pruning. So suppose we have this simple query like this. And your voice is down, maybe. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Sorry. Try to be here now. Uh, so if you have like simple query like this, and uh, so basic data flow, first you will scan the table, then you apply the filter. So but in normal uh, pipelines, so now we use a push down. So we first we will filter, and then uh, we will scan only what we need. And if you have a partitioning tables, so first we will filter by partitions and just skip what we don't use it. Um, so, but in uh, that engineering job, so quite often what we need to do, uh, it's not just simple query. We have to join with some dimensional table. So if you work with uh, like proper star schema data. So in this case, if you join with a dimensional table, so actually you don't know how to how to filter your fact tables. Uh, so what, what happens? So on, on the right side, so you have your fact tables, uh, you have dimensional tables. You can filter dimensional tables, but uh, it doesn't help you. So the, as any data engineer, so you, what we usually do, yes, we usually just join both tables and we have one big uh, table, it's white table where we have everything. But it also has disadvantages that we cannot maintain it. So if uh, something changed, so we have to reload all the data. Um, so that's why in this talk, so we will show so how to implement exactly these things, like how can we apply this filter from a dimensional table on a fact table. So let's have a look in a nutshell how this Spark uh, will work. So we run our query using different API. It could be Python, Scala, SQL, anything. So then Spark use a logical plan. Uh, it's just uh, rule-based transformations. It could be like push down, uh, you can cut col columns, and so on. Then this logical plan transform to physical plan. So the physical plan is like execution plan that uh, show, it actually uh, tells the Spark uh, what exactly do on uh, on your cluster, right? So we will see first on a logical level, so how we can implement it. So suppose we have a table, uh, a fact table is a partitioning table, and a dimensional table is not partitioned. So first we will scan both. Uh, first we will scan dimensional table, and we will filter it. Uh, for example, we need only two values. So and then we will join it. In an ideal case we should join it uh, with uh, only two partitions from the fact tables. Um, so simple approach, just on the logical level, what, what we will do. Uh, we, it would be good if we can apply this uh, query, how we filter uh, dimensional, dimensional table uh, before we scan a big fact, fact table. It's, it's, so it sounds good, sounds logical. Uh, the question is how we can implement it. Because if you'll do ju just like this, so it will be just double work, so we have to run the same query twice, and then uh, not, not easy to implement. And it could be quite expensive. So that's why let's see how we can implement it on a physical level. So on a physical level, uh, so you remember we draw in fact tables with a dimensional table. Dimensional table usually quite small. So that's why Spark uh, will use a broadcast hybrid join. Right? Uh, so in this case, so it reads the dimensional table, creates small hash table, and then uh, put it as a like, broadcast variable, so and distribute across all the cluster. So you have this table on all the nodes, and that's why you can do 
uh, join uh, without shuffle, just locally, right? So it was exactly here. So this is a trick. So what we can do? So now when we did this broadcast join, we have the result. And now we can ingest this result uh, when we do this file scan. So we exactly get this di uh, dynamic filter. So this is how, how it works. Quite simple. OK, so now we have this filter. And now we can filter uh, fact tables uh, uh, when, we uh, when we scan it. So th uh, they also provide uh, some tests. Um, so they run it on uh, this uh, TPC DS uh, data set with uh, 1 and 10 uh, ter terabytes of the data. The cluster on AWS, so the 10 machines. I think it's the same instance that uh, Arsini recommended. And uh, with uh, Spark 3.0. So if you can see on a uh, uh, data set of the t one terabyte, so it's uh, 60 out of 100 uh, queries. So they run, they speed up between two and uh, 18 times. Yes, quite impressive. And if you can see uh, the top 10 queries, uh, so they increase uh, around 10 times. So and uh, if you know, like if you ask why, so I think this is uh, quite obvious because you skip most of the data. So you see this query, this uh, don't rate around 95 of the data. So that's why you get a result like this. You just skip the data. Got it? No? <laughs> uh, OK. I have to again say. <laughs> so uh, go back. So uh, at the beginning, let's say we have uh, six partitions uh, on our table. Uh, and if you just don't use this uh, dynamic filtering, we have to read all of them, and we have to then filter and find uh, these two values, right? If we use the dynamic filter, so we will skip four partitions, and we will read only two of them. So that's why uh, you read like uh, three times less data. So that's why, yes, uh, every query will uh, run much faster. So you see, in this case, for, for, this quer for these queries, uh, yeah, they, they just don't read like 90% of the data. And if you compare with uh, 10 terabytes of the data, so it will be like even better. Like uh, the query runs 100 times faster. So and uh, this is this query so that we mentioned this in the beginning. Uh, you see, we have a join of three tables. Uh, and uh, in a date, so actually we scan only one month. So the table itself, it's uh, five years. So of course, if we will scan not five years, but only one month, so then you have uh, a resu result like this. Better? What if you have to scan all the data? Sorry? You know, we, in the bank, right, we do financial calculations. Most of the time, we end up scanning all the data, right? To all the transactions and all. Mm. Depends on the workflow. Yes, of course, it depends on the work on the workflows, and so just to finalize uh, this, uh, so uh, this dynamic par uh, partition pruning. Uh, so they use it. Uh, so the idea was how to implement on logical level. So then we can implement with uh, broadcast uh, join on a physical level. Uh, the main feature of this is that for data engineers who use exactly uh, like uh, schema, st uh, like star schema data, uh, it will work now faster. So you, do, uh, you don't need to like avoid it or create like the normalized uh, very wide tables. I also want to mention here uh, uh, a few uh, limitations of this. So the first of first, it's uh, exactly what you mentioned. You have to uh, have your right fact tables partitioning by this key that you are going to join. So if it's not, of course, it doesn't work. Uh, second thing, uh, it will work only with uh, broadcast join. So it means uh, that uh, dimensional tables should be quite small. And by default, in the Spark, it's 10 megabytes. So of course, you can uh, change it, but just uh, keep in mind. And one more thing, uh, it's also limited only for equal join. So you cannot join with like my values greater than something or less than something. 
Question? So, uh, so the example which you are showing, uh, the fact tables are basically, uh, you know, yeah, the very first example. So the fact tables are basically partitioned by date, right? Mm -hmm. Let's see this. Yeah. So yeah, here the fact tables are basically partitioned by date. So when you are check, uh, when you are taking like a Monday, it's what it's doing. It's like it taking all the Mondays dates, which all which are all Mondays, and just picking up those partitions from there, right? Mm. The very first example which we did, uh, like date time equals to uh, mo Monday, M O N, mm -hmm. right? So it's picking all the dates which are Monday. Yes. And picking up all those partitions uh, from the fact table. Yes. Exactly, right? So it, it, it is it is quite similar to like, you know, I mean, collect all the Mondays and then do a in, where in. Exactly. So day of week is Monday. So what exactly is being done here is like you are taking all the dates which are Monday, which are Monday, and you are applying dynamically filter on that since the fact tables is partitions by date. So you are picking up all the Monday, like dates which are Monday. Right? Uh, I think it's just uh, for the clarity for the slides. So they put like Monday. Uh, usually, of course, you, you keep it as a, as a date. And your fact tables is partitioning by, by date. Yeah. So like year, month, and date. I'm just saying an equivalent uh, uh, idea of that. Like, I mean, what you are, it's being done here is like you're picking all the dates like Monday. Suppose today and a week after, a week after. So those three days, and you're just picking up dynamic, dynamically picking up those dates from the fact tables like those partitions but you don't know it the idea here is like your sales table here does not contain the definition of monday but your sql expression I here that. yeah yeah so you, you join I accept it right? that. that's what i'm saying that we i will get a list of names yeah a list of you know, dates right which are on monday yeah right? And yeah, but this is this is this expensive because you have to. This is what Aliona says, like double processing. That's what I'm saying. Under the hood, it's it's being done that these are the dates are Monday. Now from fact table, put where in in this list. Exactly, that's what is being done. It's there. double processing. Yeah, but this is the improvement in like three to zero. You basically compress the pipeline from this one to this one by pushing the uh, logic into the physical planning into the level where the plan is executed. So Catalyst is getting more and more capability. Thank you. Okay, good. So then let's uh, switch to another talk. Uh, so it was a session about uh, file sources in, uh, that uh, Spark supports. So just from my point, uh, point of view, it's quite uh, like beginner level. So if you know something, so we can just skip it. So I will ask, like, if you know, so we can just skip and save time. Uh, so we will, we can uh, cover file formats that allow it, uh, layout and uh, file readers and uh, writers. Uh, okay, so the Spark supports uh, columnar format and uh, uh, row format. Do you have a difference? Do you know the difference? Like, who, who doesn't know the difference? Okay, so yeah, we can skip it. <laughs> yes. Okay, so you know what what uh, what does it mean? So that's why we can uh, we can just speak uh, directly but shortly about the columnar format. Uh, so it's uh, as a parquet or ORC files. So who knows how uh, how parquet uh, like works inside? No one knows. Okay. Uh, so let's see a bit in the details. So it's uh, the structure of the parquet file inside. Uh, so you know, right, so this is a columnar format. Uh, so it's not, not row. So inside we have a, a list of the row groups. And uh, the main thing maybe in the parquet files is the footer. So inside footer we contains like all the metadata for, for this file. So that's why uh, when Spark start read it, actually it start to read from the footer, from the end of the file. So then, uh, and also in the footer, we, we have a schema. So that's why when we read it, uh, we can filter by these uh, like row groups. And uh, we also have uh, stat statistics like minimum and maximum. So that's why we can skip something that uh, uh, is not related for this query. Um, yes, it's more details about this. And this how how you actually this 
uh, row group s s uh, skipping works. So because it's ag again based on the previous talk, if you have, uh, if you can skip more data, so it will work faster. Uh, another format, who knows the format of RC? One, one, two men. <laughs> okay, it's my favorite format. So that's why. Uh, that's how I know it. <laughs> <laughs> so the actually, the RC the comes maybe a bit later after parquet, parquet but at least from my opinion, it's, uh, it's just better. So it was uh, developed by Horton Works, uh, uh, mostly for Hadoop. So now it's Spark also like uh, built-in format. So it's very nice. The format quite similar with the parquet, uh, with some uh, small difference. So this is like your own uh, like old full file. Uh, you also have uh, like so they call it stripes. It's a uh, like set of the set of the uh, lines, set of the rows. Like one stripe here is uh, 250 megabytes. Uh, and also you have a footer. So the same in the footer, you have some uh, statistics uh, about the column and a number of rows uh, per stripe. So, and, and also you have uh, index. So inside index, you have information about min and max, and inside uh, each uh, stripe, you have a stripe footer where you have information uh, about encoding each column. So because, it, for example, it could be column with city, and if it uh, has all the value, for example, that's Singapore, so you can store only like Singapore uh, one million times. So you store just two values instead of uh, one million. So this is all of information uh, inside uh, Stripe footer. Uh, yes, so when you read it, so the same, it's very efficient for data skipping because you have all the information about this, uh, uh, this Stripe. So suppose your Stripe is like, yes, it's 250 megabyte. And if you know that uh, your data uh, is not inside this, uh, not inside this block, you can skip 200 megabytes. So, so that's why you, you read it uh, also very fast. Uh, okay. So then uh, next, we can have a look on a, a row-oriented format. Uh, so I think you you should be familiar with this. Uh, so we have a like, semi-structured uh, format. It's a JSON and CSV. Uh, both of them very good for for the writing. Uh, I think if you create a parquet in RC and you, you notice that it takes more time, so then write just CSV. So exactly because you collect all the statistics and put all, all this information like in a footer, so uh, like divided on by stripers. Uh, in if you write CSV or something like this, you don't need anything, so you just write it. So that's why it's very fast. And usually that's why you use a CSV a file for logs. Uh, so the disadvantage of this will be uh, uh, this schema. So you need to define uh, the schema uh, mostly manually. So the Spark has this opportunity. It can read the schema from the file. But if you work in the production, usually you prefer to define your own schema. Um, so this is the same uh, for, for JSON. Uh, uh, even if you can read the schema from JSON, but it's still recommended so to, to put uh, to put your own schema. So there is a uh, so who knows the format Avro? Okay, just a few people. So the Avro actually very similar with the JSON, but in this case you have a schema uh, on top of the file. Uh, and with JSON, you have to put uh, like your field uh, with every value. But for the Avro, uh, you have you define schema only one time. So that's why the file is quite compact and uh, quite fast. And usually, if you work with, uh, let's say, different uh, clients, and you have some event data, uh, so in this case, your you event comes with from different data source, and you have to keep uh, the same schema. So that's why actually Avro will be the best choice. Uh, uh, but for example, with JSON, so it uh, it's also works, uh, and uh, especially for development when you just develop, so it's uh, very fast. So usually you prefer just this to start to start with this. Uh, with CSV file, I think uh, familiar uh, everything, 
Uh, yes, it's easy, it's uh, human readable, but you have all this problem with separator, with escaping, with quoting. Actually, Spark uh, uh, helps a lot because it has already built tools to parse all the schema. So, but uh, still. Uh, you also know that Spark uh, supports uh, just text file. Uh, in this case, it will read it, and we have only one column value with all these uh, with all these lines. Uh, the new 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 format will be supported from uh, Spark 30 It's a binary, so the binary is, for, for example, a picture. Uh, so in this case, uh, it will read, uh, for example, all the pictures inside this folder and store in data frame like one row, uh, like one file, uh, with its own schema. Uh, so we'll have the pass, uh, the time, uh, the length of this, and the content itself. So it's like will be a binary object. So it sh should, be, uh, should be very interesting. And here you have, uh, so they have an example uh, how we will read this binary file. And you see like two new options. So these new options I think will be available starting from uh, uh, Spark uh, 3.0. Uh, the one of this is pass globe filter. And this feature allows you to use uh, uh, regular expressions uh, to select only some special files. So you know that currently you cannot do it uh, with Spark. So because Spark will process everything what you, what you put in the folder. So and, uh, yes, if you put some, some trash, so it will just fail. Uh, and one more thing, so this recursive file lookup uh, allows you to read the data and skip the uh, partitioning. So for example, you don't need the partitions. So you'll just read everything and like you have everything in uh, one folder. Sometimes it may be needed. I think maybe, yes, when you read the pictures, so it could, could be useful. Uh, next, uh, next thing, it's about uh, partitioning and bucketing. Who knows everything about partitioning? Everything? Oh. No, I think it's qu quite simple, so it's... Uh, okay, I just uh, do it very quickly. So the partitioning, so you know, uh, you just put uh, your data in like in different folders. Uh, you usually choose something with uh, low cardinality. So let's say uh, you have a data partitioning by year, by genre, and then some files. So and if you query uh, where uh, music in this year and this genre, so you will read only this folder, only this folder. So and you skip uh, all others. I will also skip many files because I want to show only, yes, so uh, the things that you need to remember about partitioning. Try to avoid many partitions uh, because first of all, if you work with Metastore, it will be quite uh, high pressure on Metastore if you have, let's say, more than 1,000 partitions. Um, also try to avoid uh, to create uh, partitions on the columns with high cardinality. So it will just, you have, it just create like a lot of partitions. So that's why it uh, makes no sense. Or what they suggest, use uh, Delta Lake. So we mentioned about Delta Lake uh, today. So actually uh, Delta Lake uh, allows you uh, to handle with uh, like billions of partitions. Why? Because uh, the, delta, the delta format, it's like uh, parquet, but with transaction log. So if you add any new file in your folders, so it will be just like new records in this folder. So that's why you see uh, we can have in uh, this transaction log all information about uh, all partitions. So that's why it really can handle like billions. So it doesn't matter how many of them you have. So it's one good thing uh, about delta. Uh, one more topic about bucketing. Who familiar with bucketing? Okay. <laughs> okay, let's have a look closer. Uh, so the bucketing, it's uh, quite a bit similar with uh, partitioning, but works like vice versa. So when you do partitioning, you usually choose a column uh, with low cardinality. So usually what we use for partitioning, it's like date. You can partition by year, by month, by date, or maybe by hours. Uh, 
uh, for the bucketing, uh, you usually choose the columns uh, like ID, where there are a lot of uh, distinct values. So then you do what? So because, uh, okay, first, uh, why we need bucketing? Bucketing helps you to do join between two big uh, tables. Could be done, two fact tables. Uh, so uh, for the bucketing, you select columns. It should be the same column in, the, in these two tables. Let's say like client ID or like customer ID. And then, so this is just, this slide shows us if you don't have uh, bucketing, so it will just, you need to first do shuffle, you need to do sort, and only after this, so you can join uh, these two tables. So it will be very slow. But uh, uh, with the bucketing, so it will be like pre-shuffle and pre-sort. So how it works? Uh, you have this, uh, I don't know, like one column with uh, a lot of ID. So then uh, use, let me show you this. Uh, so in this, uh, so when you create a table, you just say my table will be clustered by uh, this column into five buckets. It means you uh, divide all the all your IDs in five five buckets, and then uh, you do the same for the both table. And then you will, when you will join it, so it will be joined by by, by buckets. So that's why you don't need to do shuffle. You don't need to do sort. So it's already will be pre your data already will be uh, pre-sorted, so that's why it will be work uh, much faster. Yes. Uh, is it using the same hashing function as hiring? Uh, the same what? Hashing function. Yes, of course. Yes, it uses hashing uh, uh, hash function. Is it the same? Is it the same with hive? Because hive does it. It is. It, it's exactly the same. It's exactly what what we use bucketing in hive. So the idea is the same, and I think implementation is the same. Uh, so about the hash function, uh, so just the, to give understanding, let's say we have the ID, it could be some integer numbers, uh, and your hash function could be, for example, all the IDs that uh, end on, for example, one, we will put in one bucket. All IDs that uh, ends, like last number in the ID is two, we will put in, in another bucket. So, and then we can create like 10, ten different buckets. Right, so and then you can join like if you have an ID with uh, that ending with one, so you will join it with a different table from the same bucket. Okay, I hope it's a bit clearer. Um, so for the bucketing, uh, yes, uh, it's also uh, enable you efficient uh, data skipping, because yes, you, you have all this information, all the statistics. Um, a bit more interesting thing about how the Spark uh, reads the data. So suppose we have this uh, simple query, and our goal is to understand so how we can. Uh, so the, the main main goal is to skip as many data as possible. So that's why uh, your, your query will run uh, run faster. Uh, so suppose our data is like this. So we have some folder. So it's partitioning by uh, years. So and we have this data. So based on our query, so we query uh, where the year is uh, 2019. So it means we will skip all these folders. So we will read only one, only this folder, right? Uh, then we query only city Amsterdam. So in this case, when we read the parquet file, so we can skip a row group that doesn't contain uh, Amsterdam. Because you have all this information about what you have inside this group. So you have this information uh, in the footer. So we will skip all of them. And next thing, uh, because we query uh, only timestamp and a filter by city, so actually we need just to read only two columns, right? So apart all of these data that you have, so finally you just uh, open the file and read just uh, two columns from this file. And uh, second thing, uh, we want to do it in parallel. So when we read it, so what we do for this? Uh, usually we just uh, split your data in uh, partitions with the same size. So because normally you have a file with a different size. So what Spark uh, usually does, so on a driver, uh, so the driver split it on, on the partitions, and uh, then we have launch the task, 
and then the, this task they will, re will read this data from uh, this partition. So that's why you will read uh, so it's like, like universal size for all uh, for all your partitions. Okay, and uh, we can finish with uh, how the Spark uh, writes the data. So suppose we read it and now we want to, to write. Yes, you, you remember how, how to do it. Um, so how Spark will write? Uh, so again, uh, the Spark driver creates executors. So in, uh, when executors start to write, so it's uh, create like temporary file and temporary folder for each task. Um, so when you when you want to check, so usually you can see like in a, this created temporary folder. So when you go inside, you will see uh, another temporary folder with a job ID because the different job can run in the same folder. So all all of them have a different ID, uh, and then that every task also has their own uh, ID. So that's why there is uh, different uh, folders for different task attempt. So suppose. Uh, we write this file, so then we send the commit. Okay, so the file is done. Uh, so uh, in this case, you can see, okay, so this is committed. So it's not, not an in temporary folder anymore, so it's like a normal folder. Uh, so it's still in the progress. Uh, suppose some task can fail. So in this case, we send, okay, it's uh, abort this task. And uh, so we will delete uh, all, all previous uh, files what we have and uh, we relaunch the task again. So and then we hope, okay, so now we can uh, write it, so just commit it. When we commit it, we commit drop itself. So when you commit the drop, so now you have your clear results. Good, and how they do it for the transactional? So it's exactly like this. So if we commit, uh, if we commit everything, so we move the files to the final locations. Uh, if something uh, wrong, so we delete uh, what we created. So when we say like, drop fails. Yeah, the, the the links below are quite important. So when you're doing that on the this commit protocol, it uh, doesn't specify that it's an it's basically an HDFS flavor. So you're assuming that there is a file system that is lockable. So you are able to guarantee a commit on the subsystem that is below Spark. Now, the links below on the transactional cloud storage, uh, um, transactional uh, cloud storage rights, this is a bit different. So S3 is the major, who has data on S3? Everyone. Everyone, right? So data on S3, like regardless of the super source implementation on AWS side, it has multiple availability zones, and there's a metadata heads, and there's basically some latency in between. Inherently, it's microseconds or like milliseconds. There is some latency. There is no transactional guarantee in the S3 protocol. So if you have some workers and some drivers across the regional specification of S3, chances are there could be different availability zones, and there is no guarantee on the commit side. So there is pat patented, like in Databricks, for example, there is like a way that is uh, above the storage level to guarantee the transactional commits on the object store. And then there is another one on the Delta Lake. So this is actually really cool, but uh, it, it, an, it assumes this is a open source part, and it assumes that the commits are then guaranteed by the level of the POSIX, right? So just, just, just figure that there is not only POSIX systems, which is object system, right? So, yeah. It's a slight detour, sir. But it's good, thank you. Okay, so just uh, for the recap, so we cover uh, column-oriented uh, files, so some uh, row-oriented that I hope everyone knows. Uh, what is the partitioning, what is the bucketing, uh, so how Spark read and how Spark write. I finished before nine. Yay, yeah, yeah, yeah. before nine, yay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Questions? I have questions. Yes. Is there any case when I should use Parquet instead of ORC? Uh, Seems like org is a better Parquet. Uh, yes, I think yes if you have a nested data. So nested data. Yes, if you have like nested and nested and nested, then uh, Parquet is better than ORC. Okay. 
it's a it's a good like the, the anecdote. I don't have any evidence to that, but the the good the good story is because it's open source. It it all in the end converges to how many other communities you are able to convince to support your format first. Yeah. So it all kind of like converged into what we observed. Why we we structured Delta Lake on top of Parquet, not ORC, because like the data driven decision, like ninety percent of the data sets that we observed like everywhere that we looked at was in Parquet. Yeah. Because Parquet team was run Apache Parquet team was basically running around more meetups and I guess just like convincing <laughs> people to converge into their direction. Let's been around longer also. Yeah, well that that is another factor, yeah, but it's yeah. Good. Thank you. Well, cool. Gabe, thank you once again for hosting us.